This is An Economy of One with Gary Rathbun. Joining me now is Stephen Moore. He's a Fox News contributor. He's a distinguished visiting fellow of the Project for Economic Growth at the Heritage Foundation. And prior to joining the Heritage Foundation, he wrote on the economy and public policy for the Wall Street Journal. Stephen, welcome to An Economy of One. Hi, Gary. How you doing? Good. Merry Christmas. Thank you. And to you and your family also. Uh, So, um, Janet Yellen finally raised interest rates today, and it's one of those things that it seemed to be fairly anticlimactic. I mean, we've been talking about it for a year or so about raising rates, and uh, the market didn't seem too upset with the increase today. (laughs) Well, no, it sure didn't. I mean, the market went through a 200 plus point rise right. on the Dow. Uh, but look, this, this was all uh, baked into the cake. So mm-hmm. I, I don't, I don't think it was the announcement by, um, Yellen that, that caused the market to go up by 200 points because people already knew it was going to go up. Um, look, I think this was long overdue. I think yeah. we've had seven years of zero interest rate <clears throat> policy and easy money, and it hasn't gotten us anywhere. If you've got a losing economic strategy, you change it. Um, and look, there's a superstition in Washington that is very, uh, widely believe that somehow you can create jobs and create prosperity and, and create uh, a better economy by printing money. Mm-hmm. Well, if, as I've always said, you know, if that's the case, then Mexico and Argentina should be the richest <laughs> countries in the world because all that's they right. do is print money. Um, right. And we've tried this. And, you know, the, the point is for the average American, it hasn't had a positive impact. I mean, we've got 10 million people unemployed in this country. We've got no wage increases. The average family has actually lost wealth over the last 15 years. So where is the evidence? I mean, show me uh, where the evidence is that this uh, this policy of, of easy money and zero interest rates has helped the worker of America. I see none. Yeah, it, it's, you know, we look at it from the standpoint as us baby boomers, and I'm a baby boomer, as we hit retirement, uh, the interest, the income we earn on our money has been virtually zero. And even though it went up 25 basis points today, I can guarantee you the CD rate isn't going up 25 basis points tomorrow. Well, that's true, but low interest rates are good for the economy on balance, not bad, because they, they reduce the cost of capital and sure. they make it uh, sure. easier to, uh, to, uh, to borrow for, you know, expanding, or either to take out a mortgage or something like that. Mm-hmm. But here's my point, is that the problem with the U.S. economy over the last <laughs> several years has not been a monetary problem. I mean, I, I don't believe in zero interest rates, but I look, my attitude is the impact of this a quarter percentage point increase in interest rates is going to be de minimis on the economy because the problems are fiscal. They're tax. They're mm-hmm. regulatory. We're strangling our industries with regulations. We're taxing uh, profits and investment and business creation. So you, when you tax something, you get less of it. And again, this is one of these mythologies that somehow we're going to make up for bad tax and regulatory policy by, by uh, printing money. That That is a bad strategy. So now, now that we've got this new interest rate policy, let's see the feds do something about lowering the tax rates. Let's cut our corporate tax rate to 15%. Let's uh, roll back Obamacare, which is a negative for employment. Mm-hmm. Let's start drilling for our oil and gas. Let's start um, you know, building the Keystone Pipeline. All of those things will make the economy grow, uh, but I don't think Obama wants to do any of those things. Now, you know, speaking of that, and we'll pivot a little bit from the Federal Reserve, uh, yesterday, uh, Speaker, uh, Speaker of the House Paul Ryan unveiled a $1.6 trillion budget. Uh, is there anything in there that you see is going to help the economy very much? Well, on balance, it's a very bad bill. And this was, remember, do you remember, it was about a month or six weeks ago, the Republicans caved into Obama, they mm-hmm. raised the debt ceiling, mm-hmm. they got yep. rid of the budget caps. Yep. Well, this is the bitter fruits of that. So now they're passing a <laughs> $1.06 trillion spending bill that has all sorts of, you know, uh, ridiculous spending in there. Um, uh, but there is one good, and by the way, you would think that we were running surpluses, not, you know, half trillion, a trillion dollar deficits, the right. way we're spending money in Washington. Both parties, by the way, are responsible for this. Yep. I'm a Republican, but I was, I'm in, as embarrassed with with the Republicans are, as I am with the Democrats. And the little, dirty little secret is both parties like to spend money yep. uh, that we don't have. Uh, the one good thing in this bill, maybe the one single thing that I can point to that is very positive, is that it lifts the moratorium on uh, exporting oil and gas from the United States. That's a four-year-old policy yep. that has been a... Uh, 
a straitjacket on American energy production. Uh, this is long overdue. Barack Obama didn't want to do it because his green green energy plans hate, uh, hate you know hate oil and gas production. Right. But you know we got more of this stuff than anybody else in the world thanks to the shale oil and gas revolution. Right. We ought to be producing it. We ought to be exporting it, and we ought to be uh, using this as not just an economic tool but a tool to defund the terrorists because we know that ISIS gets all its money from petrodollars. Right. Right. Absolutely right. And, you know, in reading through this, uh, of course, you have the, the pundits out there that think lifting that that export ban is a, a terrible thing and it's going to increase the, the supply and drive oil down further and and that kind right. of stuff. But um, I, I'm with you. I, I think it's it's a small step, small step toward more of a freer market uh, economy and free market right. capitalism. Well, these are look. I don't think it's a small step. I think it's a big deal because mm-hmm. we could increase our output by about fifty billion dollars. Now, look, wow. this is amazing. Here we've got this terrible economy. We've got you know uh, terrorist incidents that are happening around the world. And mm-hmm. you know, I live in Washington D.C. The terrorists say they want to go after Washington as the next target. So we're we're very nervous about this. What does the president do? He holds a summit on climate change. Right. I mean, I'm sorry, Mr. President, that is not the highest priority for our country right now. It's not even one of the ten highest priorities. We got to do something about terrorism. We've got to do something about the economy. Producing more oil here at home is going to do that. He's saying we should keep this oil in the ground. It's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Why would we do that? It hurts American workers, and it makes us more dependent on foreign oil that, that, uh, that is basically funding the people who are trying to kill us. I don't get it. Yeah, yeah well, and, and anything in the economy, any, any production, any growth has to have energy. And of course. we, we got to have that stuff. Yeah. 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 And by the way, this is why low energy prices, I know like some places in the country that are producing oil, uh, you know, like Texas and Oklahoma and North Dakota and parts of Ohio and parts of, uh, you know, uh, mm-hmm. Pennsylvania, West Virginia, they're hurt by the low energy prices. But everybody else is, I, look, I don't see too many p- people complaining about paying a dollar eighty nine a gallon at the <laughs> gas pump. I mean, do you? No, not especially this time of year, you know, they, <laughs> exactly. they got other things to spend their money on, you know. So, yeah. uh, yeah. And in Ohio, I mean, we're, we're a big fracking, fracking yeah, state here. I mean, we, we've yeah. got, uh, that's a big industry. It is. But you know, as the, there's an old saying, the necessity is the mother of invention is mm-hmm. as the you know price goes down, the frackers are getting better at this. They're starting to make money at even lower prices. Uh, but for our manufacturing industry, for our transportation industry, for consumers, for the restaurant industry, for everybody else, low, low oil prices are a boom. I think a lot of people get this story wrong. We want the look. I, look, I want the price of oil to go to two dollars. You know? sure, so we sure. pay for, you know, a quarter at the pump because we still are a net importer of oil. So what we the more the price goes down, the the better it is for the American economy. It reduces our trade deficit, reduces our budget deficit, and so on. Uh, but other than that one element of the budget. I don't see much else good in this budget. I, I wish I could say it's all wonderful and we're getting the budget under control, but ladies and gentlemen, we're not. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, Republicans are spending more than Harry Reid and Nancy Pelosi spent. Yeah, I mean, I made the prediction that when they they uh, lifted the ceiling on the national debt that you'd see a jump of five, six hundred billion. And sure enough, it jumped right. five, six hundred billion dollars all in a in day. The, that's, that happened just in the first few first week. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, that was amazing. I followed that. We were at uh, I, you probably know these better numbers, but we were at about eighteen point one trillion. Right. Then they passed the suspension of the debt ceiling, and two weeks later, we're at eighteen point six trillion. That's, that's a right. half a trillion dollar <laughs> increase in the debt in you know seven days or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Well, and you know, my thought process was they're going to make up for all the quote unquote extraordinary measures they took by taking money out of uh, government and pension plans and. Yep, and cooking yep. the books and all that kind of stuff. So they, they had to make up for that so they can cook the books again next time. You know? So they are so good at that, Absolutely. by the way. You know, if only they were as good at um, all the other things the government should do as they are at cooking the books, we would see some gigantic <laughs> improvement in our economy. I mean, these are the people who can't run a website. They can't, right. you know, balance the budget. They can't deliver the mail on time. But they sure have found ways to make the the, the uh, budget look better than it really is. But yeah. you're, there's no there's no escaping the fact no matter how much they try to cook the books, ladies and gentlemen, that 
our national debt is now eighteen and a half trillion dollars. That is the uh, the largest debt in American history. Uh, and if we don't stop this, you know, no country ever got rich by borrowing money, and right. that's what we're doing in spades. And we've done it under Democrats. We've done it under Republicans. I wanted. To, I was glad to see Rand Paul. I don't know if you saw that debate last night, but he mm-hmm. closed the debate by saying one of our greatest national security crises is is that's right up there with terrorism is our national debt. And he's yeah. exactly right. A great nation does not borrow and borrow and borrow and borrow, especially from our enemies. Right, right. We're talking with Stephen Moore, Distinguished Visiting Fellow for the Project for Economic Growth at the Heritage Foundation and uh, former uh, economy and uh, public policy writer with the Wall Street Journal. Uh, since you mentioned the uh, uh, presidential debate last night, uh, I'm not going to going to ask you what you think of anybody uh, because that's uh, uh, that's your own personal business but you know from from the from the what you've seen and, and the direction we're going what what's what message are, are these guys uh, men and women uh, what message are they not putting out that they should be I mean I, I understand Paul Ryan or uh, 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 Rand Paul uh, on the debt I think that's that's critical but I, I was just talking to my my board op during the break, and it seems like uh, the media is just focusing on on uh, the the uh, interpersonal comments and battles, and you wouldn't know anybody was running on the Democratic side. You know, I would like to see them. For that debate last night, I watched most of it, and I, you know, like I thought they showed a lot of um, intelligence and a lot of uh, wisdom in terms of dealing with the, you know, the threat of uh, of terrorism, which is the greatest threat we faced in many, many years. But I would like to see them talk about, you know, what I just mentioned. That one way to really roll back terrorism is to defund them. How do you defund them? We stop buying their energy. Right. We should carpet bomb their energy fields and oil fields, and then we should produce as much oil and gas as we possibly can here at home. We should produce it in Ohio. We should produce it in, you know, in uh, West Virginia. We should produce it in Texas and Oklahoma and North Dakota. Why do we want to buy our oil from Iran and from, uh, you know, Russia and, and countries that are out there trying to kill us? I, mm-hmm. I mean, I think this, so in other words, what I'm saying is the energy issue is not just one of economics, I mean, of the national security it's of the economic security and those two things are very interrelated yeah i i can uh i can see where so much of the media so much of the candidates so much of the politicians in general try to change the narrative try to change the the uh dialogue to something other than what's critical and hard decisions because i i i I truly believe and this is a cynical view of politicians um, I think every single thought they have is based around whether it's going to get them one more vote or not. Well, there's a lot of that going around. I mean, politicians are politicians. They're not <laughs> angels. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm still trying to find, you know, decide for myself. You know, mm-hmm. who is the man or woman that's going to lead us? You know, I, I love Carly. I think she's strong. She's like the Iron Lady. She reminds me of Margaret Thatcher. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, I like, uh, I thought Jeff Bush was strong last night. I thought he made a bit of a comeback. Um, you know, I think um, we've got some really good, strong conservatives and Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio. So it, mm-hmm. it's a strong field. Um, we need to uh, we need to defeat Hillary. <laughs> yes. I mean, because yes. Hillary is not a woman who, who really has much to say about the economy. Uh, that's good, <laughs> and <laughs> her foreign so. policy is is an, an exact duplicate of Obama's. And how could it not be? She was the one who was the Secretary of State that's when right. terrorism was allowed to uh, flourish around the world. Yeah, absolutely. We've been talking with Stephen Moore. He's a distinguished visiting fellow for the Project for Economic Growth at the Heritage Foundation. Foundation can't talk, and uh, Stephen, I really appreciate all your time tonight. I, I know that uh, everybody is tugging on you, wanting a, a piece of you, and uh, of course, we uh, chipped into your family time a little bit. So, uh, really appreciate you spending a few minutes with us. I uh, hope you and your family have a great, great Christmas, and uh, hope we can tap you on the shoulder again soon. Thank you. I'll talk to you soon. Appreciate you having me on. Take Thanks care. a lot, Stephen. Uh, I'm Gary Rathman. This is